به برنامه نانگارستان خوش اومدید سلام به همگی من مریم نمازی هم من فریبوز پویا هستم متاسفیم که یه مدتی نبودیم امیدواریم که مشتاق دیدن برنامه ما هستید شما استراحت کردیم مدت که نه زیاد نه زیاد نه زیاد در برنامه این هفته در رابطه با خبر خوب رایگیری برای رفراندوم برای استقلال کردستان عراق واقعا خبر جالب و امید بخشی بود جدا. در زم فتوه احمقانمون در رابطه و یه سری یهودیایی هستن که با چشم بند به فرودگاه میرن که مبادا همه جا فقط فرودگاه هر جا که, که زن... زنان بی بند و رو نبینن خیلی بعضشون خرابه و خبر خوب این هفته از عربستان سعودی و اینکه بالاخره زنان میتونن اونجا رانندگی کنن و ز... فعالین زن در اون کشور گفتن که بردیم و مصابه این هفته من با سنال ادام روکو پریزیدنت رشنالیس اینترنشنال با ما باشید جایی نرید رفراندوم در کردستان عراق صورت گرفته برای استقلال کردستان ما میدونیم که بیش از 92 درصد مردم اونجا رأی دادن که مستقل بشن و 80 درصد از کسایی که حق رأی دارن شرکت کردن تو این رفراندوم واقعا یه چیز زیبایی بود دیدنش و اینکه میدونین یه واقعا یه جای امید وقتی یه چنین حرکت واقعا آزاد اندیشانه آدم میبینه دقیقا و این تو منطقه اتفاق داره میفته که جنگ، خرابی، تروریزم، کور مذهبی بیداد میکنه و در واقع تو حکومته توی عربستان کشورهای خلیج رو نگاه کنین تو عراق رو نگاه کنین سوریه رو نگاه کنین ترکیه رو نگاه کنین ایران رو نگاه کنین و در واقع کردستان شده یه مرکزی و صد این دعوا میشه در تو با حقوق زن صحبت کرد میشه صحبت از آزادی کرد میشه صحبت از سکولاریسم کرد و نیروهای بلقوه این حرکت ها و ایدال ها وجود داره در اون جامعه و یکی از نیروهای محرکه برای نگه داشتن این در واقع این شرایط همین نیروهای مترقی هستن تو جامعه و اهمیت داره که از این در واقع پشتیبانی کرد و درسته که پشتیبانی کرد یه چیزی که هست خب دولت های ترکیه و ایران و عراق دارن میگن که این منطقه را بی ثبات میکنه منطقه بی ثبات هست اتفاقا یک کردستان مستقل یک امیدی برای ثبات بخشیدن به اون منطقه به خاطر که نشون میده که فقط از طریق دیکتاتوری و حکومت های مذهبی و جنگ و غیره لزومی نیست که پیش رفت کرد. میشه با طرفداری از حق و حقوق پایه ای هم این کارو کرد و خب بالاخره مشخصه توی کردستان عراق هم مشکلات زیادی وجود داره ولی در این حال میبینیم که بحثا و فعالیت های خیلی مهمی داره صورت میگیره که یک نور امیدی برای نه فقط مردم کرد یا کردستان بلکه برای کل جهان و کمه همه مردم این رو متوجه میشم کسایی که در واقع یک ذره قلبشون برای آزادی و رفاع مردم و در واقع منافع دیگه کورشون نکرده جلوی چشمشون نگرفته و تمام دنیا باید از کردستان مستقل و در واقع استقلال یه درجه از سکیلاریز حقوق زنان آزادی رهایی و شرایط دیگه بشه در این, در, در این مورد و مسئله صحبت کرد به من نتیجه رسید و باید از این دفاع کرد هم که همطور هم که یادتونه چند وقت پیش من خودم رفتم سلیمانیه در کنگره روشنگری فمینیزم شرکت کردم کدوم کشور منطقه واقعا میشه رفت و این بحثا رو کرد و دفاع کرد از جدایی مذهب از دولت یعنی واقعا به شکل آزادانه علنی به شکل از... تو عربستان دقیقا. سعودی میشه توی تهران میشه این کاری کرد توی بغداد میشه این کارو کرد تو ترکیه هم نمیشه ترکیه نمیشه این کارو بکنه واقعا بعد ازش دفاع کرد اینا همه دولت های منطقه و خیلی از دولت های دیگه شاخشون رو تیز کردن دارن تهدید میکنن میخوان بایکات کنن این وظیفه همه مردم جهانه که بیان و دفاع کنن از یک کردستان مستقل به نفع همه مردم دنیاست
Sana Led America, great pleasure to have you with us. We wanted to ask about the Rationalist Conference. Why are you holding this conference annually? Why is it important to do that? We have a lot of organizations and a lot of important people all around the world who are committed and who are doing a lot for the spreading of secularism, the idea that people can, should be liberated out of the shackles of religion. But there should be some kind of coordination of all these kind of people so that we can exchange ideas, exchange our experience so that we can study from each other. I would always feel that every conference I personally, despite that I'm organizing it, I got a lot of lessons, I studied a lot out of it. And back in 1995 when we had the first Rationalist International Conference in India, we had a lot of people coming, like from Polkots to I mean, the, 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 the topmost uh, I mean, uh, skeptics and rationalists and humanists all around the world have been coming to us. And this has been an opportunity for people to meet across organizations. Not one organization, because since I don't have too much commitment to one uh, brand of rationalism or atheism or, or secularism, I, I, I consider myself part of all the whole movement. So therefore, I try to bring all the people together at one forum so that we can exchange ideas, we can study from each other. Because everybody's experience, everybody's uh, struggle is a lesson for other people and it's encouragement and inspiration for the other people. And they are taking it back to their organizations and that's how we are expanding our experiences into a wider realm. I mean, you're someone who's uh, had to flee even for your life, basically, from India because of your fight for rationalism. Tell us a little bit about what happened. And the other thing you mentioned at the conference was that three of your colleagues, three of your, uh, you know, co-rationalists, have actually been killed in India. So the situation is quite dire, isn't it? Starting from that, it's not three, now four, uh, because three famous uh, rationalists who are associated with our work have been killed since I left India. The Maharashtra rationalist leader Narendra Dabolkar was fighting for an anti-superstition bill in the local assembly and he was almost reaching at it. The, the Hindu organizations, especially the radical Hindu fringe groups, have been so unhappy with him and he was killed point blank. So was the case of Pansare and Kalburgi, a former vice chancellor of a university and a famous rationalist, was killed in the morning somebody visits him and kills. And last month, uh, a, a young ex-Muslim rationalist, Farooq, he was 27 years old and he was writing Facebook posts, very powerful Facebook posts, inspired by people like you. And you can see your picture on his Facebook page. And he was simply slaughtered and killed. So we support his family. I mean, we have raised a fund for his children to grow and um, we have taken care of the, I mean, the whole family's uh, responsibilities. But this is a growing trend in India. In the neighboring Bangladesh, it's well known that, I mean, there have been so many famous free thinkers killed. And in Pakistan, there's a series of murders going on. So the whole of South Asia is a very dangerous place now. But India, as many people would imagine, was not like that. It has been changing. And my problem started not with the Muslim organizations or Hindu organizations, interestingly, uh, because I have been, I mean, I have uh, no special love for any religion because I consider myself a critic of religion, whether it is Hinduism or Islam or Christianity, I have equidistance for all of them. I've been criticizing all the Hindu godmen and gurus and holy men and all the temples I've been speaking about. The, the, the growth of Hindu fundamentalism has been one of the major subjects of my television programs every time. But the Hindus, since they are a debated lot, or, or trying to you know, engulf even atheism as rational or, or, or part of Hindutva, so I didn't have much trouble with the Hindu uh, organizations per se, except from smaller groups. But when it came to the Catholic Church, things were different. I've exposed a miracle, a small one, I mean, which could, I've done hundreds of them in different places. But this was a miracle which was connected with a, a crucifix, which was, uh, uh, I mean, crying. And the, the, the statue was crying, they claimed. And I found that it was just a plumbing problem and there was a leakage in the drainage and water was going up in capillary action and that was it. And I could, uh, not only that I could find it out, I sent the collected water for chemical analysis and found that the E. coli bacteria level is much, much above than human tolerance level. But I 
said this in a television program in the evening, prime time, and the bishop wanted it to be stopped. Instead, the channel, they said, we don't stop it. The bishop can join him in the discussion. And that was the whole problem. I was a good debater, and the bishop felt that he was humiliated in the debate. And he sent goons outside the studio to attack me. It began that. Next day, I heard that 17 cases against me at different places. We have an old blasphemy law, wherein the judiciary need not have to interfere. The police officer in full right to keep a person in custody till the case is filed. That's the only crime where it's still existing like that. So I don't have a possibility to get bail as per this law. And I, I, they need not take me to a, a, a court of law because I can be protected in police custody for my safety. That's the law. So this is the law they have using. Interestingly, the same Catholic Church is fighting against the same law in, in Pakistan when it is used against Christians. And I stand with them on that point. I mean, I, even if a Muslim is persecuted, I stand with them because I stand for people's... I mean, I oppose Islam as a philosophy. I, Islam, I oppose Hindutva, I oppose Christianity. But if anybody wants to practice their religion, if they're not allowed, as all of us, I would stand with them. So I was standing with the Catholics of Pakistan. Even now I stand with that. But they don't want to respect my rights to criticize their miracle. So I had to flee from the country after three months of hiding and I had to flee from the country, yeah. What's interesting though, at the conference, uh, there's a talk about all, I mean, there's such a rich history of rationalism in India, isn't it? And South Asia as well. And so it isn't just one story, you know, the regression and the religious right, whether it's Hindutva or the Islamists. There's also this huge history of atheism and rationalism. Explain that a bit. See, in India, uh, from, from something like 2,500 years from now, from the Vedic culture was emerging, parallelly, there have been a lot of critics of the system. Especially, they have been having a lot of sacrifices that began from that. A lot of people came out criticizing the sacrifices and the fallacy of that and the meaningless of that. And, for example, the series of people, I mean, perhaps it's not one person who is Charvaka, but perhaps a series of scholars what they spoke is not really available at this moment because everything is burned down. But there are books criticizing them. There are Upanishads criticizing them. So there are quotations from them. And one has, we can compile them. We have done it. And that's something like the same kind of language that most of the so-called uh, anti theists would speak at this moment. That was a language that was 2,000 years back. So what do you, I mean, so there is this battle taking place, isn't it, between the rationalists and, and those who are on the religious right. Do you have any hope that things can get better or are they getting worse? I'm an optimist on that, this point, especially regarding India. Things are not gone bad in India. I had to suffer, that's a different thing, but I'm still hopeful that India is not going the Iran way. It cannot go the Iran way because we have a democracy. The system has, you know, it's a decentralized democracy. It's, it's, it's working at very effectively at ground root, at grassroot level. So it's, it's any, any kind of government that goes beyond a certain level of oppression, with whether it's political oppression or whether it's religious oppression, and if it shows intolerance, the Indian history shows that they have been thrown off. Like the best example is the emergency. There was political oppression. There was no religious oppression. And nobody thought, I mean, in 1977, the Indian voter is not that uh, uneducated. I mean, they have a real sense. They've seen that there is a change. But a new government could again be changed. So that's still possible in India. So I don't think, for example, even, even now, for example, the pro-Hindu forces in power in India, that's a question which seriously is discussed, I mean, by all rationalists. Do they go a theocratic way later? Is that a prelude of a future theocracy going to come in India? I don't think so. Why? Because uh, even if the, the, the radical Hindu forces were used for the present government to come to power at one side, the main plank of the election was not Hindutva, but development. Anywhere they go, they use the development as a major slogan. And once they come to power, immediately the small groups use that authority that they have uh, obtained then to advance the interests of Hindutva. So therefore, 
my feeling is that if they go too close to their dream goals, the next election they'll be thrown out. Therefore, the, this, the government is very, very careful, is my feeling. But the fringe groups, that's the whole problem. In India, we have, for example, for eating beef, people are killed, lynched. And, and the, anybody, I mean, who is carrying a, a, a cow or something like that, or a, an animal which is considered to be holy, legally, well, I mean, cow slaughter is a punishable offense in most of Indian states. In Kerala, it's not. In Bengal, it's not. Many parts we can eat cow. I can eat cow in Kerala, but if we take a piece of cow meat outside Kerala, I can get life imprisonment. That's that's a law. So, but but when there is a law, if it's a crime, I mean technically, if it's a crime, the crime is not considered as a as as, as a question of punishment, but the crowds are taking things in their hand and they decide whether it was meat, whether it was, uh, I mean, beef. So what is to be done? They don't want it to be taken to a court of law. They want enemies to be, uh, I mean, eliminated. So that's the whole problem in India. Not only, I mean, cow meat an issue. For example, man and woman coming closer or people in, 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 in close proximity is not liked by many people. For example, there is an anti-Romeo squad of police in Uttar Pradesh state. There is a monk in, in, the, in the chief minister's chair in Uttar Pradesh. The police has their job. If a couple go hand in hand, they will stop them. What are you doing here? Are you married? Show, me, show us the marriage certificate. If not, why are you going together? These are the kind of questions officially are asked. So there is a tendency of reaction. You know, as I always used to tell, there are two Indias coexisting all the time. One is a modern, progressive India, scientific and, I mean, developing. And the other side, we have a medieval India. And these two Indias are coexisting. There's a permanent clash between these two Indias. The radical Hindu forces are with the medieval India. That's the whole problem. Thank you very much. یک سکتی از حسیدیک یهودی های حسیدیک هستن که وقتی میرن سوار فرودگاه هواپیما میشن چشم بند میزنن که مبادا زنان بی بندوا رو ببینن بی بندوا چطور معلوم نیست چیه یعنی همه زنای معمولی از نظر اونا بی بندوا هستن البته آقایی که اونجوری خودش هست از این رهبرشون خودش از این چیزا خاخاما چیزا نوسته به خودش نه خاخامه پیشروه در مقابل اینا من یاد من میندازه که یه ویدیو دیگه هم البته هست که تو سوشل میدیا پخش شده اینه که یه سری همین در واقع از این همین سکت مذهبی توی هاپما هستن پتوی دارن میدوزن روی روی تلویزیون به خاطر میگن این تلویزیون چیزای غیر اخلاقی پخش کنه من یاد چیز میندازه یاد این گروهی از طالبان میندازه که یه تن تلویزیون انداخته انداخته با سر با چوم و چواق داشتن تلویزیون میدن گفتن تلویزیون بد اخلاقی و نمیدونم شر... وضعیت جامعه و اینا رو خانواده ها رو خراب میکنه در زلمان تلویزیون رو داغون کرده بود یکی در مطبوعات اجتماعی میگفت که اینا چجوری میون سوار هواپیما میشن مثل همین خفاشا هست که با صدا جای خودشون پیدا میکنن اینا هم همینجوری دارن سعی میکنن صندلی خودشون پیدا کنن بعد یکی هم نوشته بود که اگر اینا صندلی بغل پنجره رو بگیرن من دیگه خیلی عصبانی میشم چون اصلا که چیزی هم نمیتونن ببینن من با اون پایین یه زن بیبندباری داره را میره <تصفيق> پس مشخصه که فتوای احمقانه فقط اسلامی نیستن درست اسلامی ها زدن به هنر رحواری فتوای ولی خب یهودی هم کم, کم نمیارن از بودایی هم براتون میگن این دفعه <تصفيق> خبر رسیده که زنان در عربستان سعودی الان اجازه دارن که رارندگی کنن و واقعا موفقیت مهمیه وقتی فکر میکنیم که اولین زنایی که اومدن رارندگی کردن به عنوان اعتراض در حالی که قدقم بوده در سال 1999 بود خیلی سالهای پیش و فعالین زن اومدن توی مطبوعات اجتماعی و گفتن که ما بردیم دقیقا و نشون میده که فشار اجتماعی روی دولت عربستان زودی که ظاهرا هیچ فشاری را قبول نمیکنه تاثیر داره و در واقع این آغاز پایان کار دولت های مذهبی توی 
عربستان سعودی و منطقه است این بعد جوردی فشار هم رو جمهوری اسلامی به خاطر زنایی ایران را اجازه نمیده توی استودیو ماه فوتبال و ورزشی برن هر روز باید بیشتر بشه این یک مبارزه است مبارزه زنایی عربستان سعودی ایران و خاورمیانه به علیه مذهب و برای رهایی و نشون میده که خیلی... فعالیت اجتماعی و بین المللی تاثیر میذاره و فعالین زنم گفتن که امنیت دولت عربستان سعودی باشون تماس گرفت و گفته بود که اجازه ندارین نظر بدین روی این که الان زنا اجازه دارن رانندگی کنن و نشون میده که تاثیر داره ولی خب این فقط یه پله خیلی کوچیکیه باید از قوانین شریع تا دولت های مذهبی رو از بین برد تا واقعا زن بتونه به یه نوعی یه آزادی هایی داشته باشه ولی واقعا زنده با زنان عربستان سعودی تا پایان دولت مذهبی در عربستان سعودی و همه جا به هر حال رسیدیم به پایان برنامه من امیدوارم برنامه جالبی بود براتون خیلی ممنون از کسایی که کمک مالی هفتگی میکنن از طریق سایت پیتریان حتما با همون تماس هم داشته باشید مشتاق شنیدن از شما هستیم تا هفته آینده روزا و شبای خیلی خوبی داشته باشین خدا Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.